Resident Evil 3 was the conclusion of an era. The days of the original PlayStation trilogy is done, and now it's time for Capcom to branch out of their comfort zone. Before work on RE3 had even fully begun, a port of Resident Evil 2 was being developed for the Sega Saturn. However, the devs realized quickly that this port wasn't going to meet expectations, so they instead turned what they were working on into something new. A brand new game meant to release on the Sega Dreamcast, which at the time was managing to even rival their almighty PlayStation in popularity. This original concept of the game was to star Jill Valentine, one of the main playable characters in the original game, as the protagonist, of course taking place after the Raccoon City incident. The story would have followed her and the rest of the surviving Stars members on a mission to Europe, which was heavily teased in the previous entries. We were going to see more of the history of Umbrella, which is the pharmaceutical corporation our heroes have been fighting against thus far. The game would have also had two Nazis as the main antagonist. However, as development on the game progressed, so did the concept in general. First off, Jill Valentine was replaced by Claire Redfield, one of the two main characters in the second game. This was due to Claire's epilogue heavily hinting at her return. And the Nazis were scrapped since Capcom feared that such a controversial inclusion would negatively affect sales in European regions. Major changes will continue to be made following the game's development until on February 3rd, 2000, the game was released onto the Sega Dreamcast as intended. Welcome everyone to yet another Resident Evil review. After reviewing Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, I cannot tell you how pumped I am to tackle this beauty. Before any of you ask, yes, I am aware I did review this game back in 2020, but as you might have guessed, that video is outdated compared to my current content, and I did not want to miss out on another chance to talk about this game. Except this time, I plan on going more in detail. Now, believe it or not, I've never actually played Resident Evil Code Veronica. No, I am reviewing Resident Evil Code Veronica X, which released on both the PlayStation 2 and Nintendo GameCube on August 21st, 2001. This port was a more refined and complete version of the game which included higher graphical presentation, extra content, and minor story changes. Other than what I just mentioned, it's essentially the same game as the Dreamcast version. Code Veronica's legacy has been met with very mixed reactions. Depending on who you ask, Code Veronica is either a poorly handled side game or an underrated classic. Judging from both the title of the video and my enthusiasm to review this title for a second time, I'm sure it's clear what side I fall in. I love this game. I bought it digitally on the PS4 to finally try it out and unexpectedly ended up falling for it, Steve bangs and all. In fact, this game left such an impression on me, I actually purchased the original Code Veronica X release for my PlayStation 2. Just having the original print of the game added to my ever-growing video game collection just fills me with joy. I think I may have gotten my point across. The last thing I will say is we've reached a point in the retrospective where I'm finally covering games I can play on the PS4, meaning all gameplay you see from now on will not be cam footage or borrowed. Now it is time to stop stalling. Let's go over- Resident Evil Now I think a good way to start out this review is to further emphasize how this was a new beginning for the series. Risks were starting to be taken, and the risk of Code Veronica is being the first Resident Evil game in the series to not have pre-rendered environments. Instead, everything is a 3D render, and if you're not paying attention, you likely won't even tell. The environments and backgrounds have just as much personality as the pre-rendered environments did in the original. This is just first of many instances of Code Veronica X taking full advantage of the new era of 6th generation gaming. Going from RE3 to this, you would notice a significant amount of polish pretty much everywhere you look. The models used this time around are leagues above the PlayStation eras. More care is put into the human characters regarding their features and this increase in technology only furthers the possibilities when it comes to the gruesome nature of the undead and other biomutated threats. Another advantage of better software is the masterful lighting. This game is the first in the series to truly use lighting to its fullest advantage to further the horror in specific areas, and to also add a certain elegance to some places you visit. Oh, and in-game cutscenes have taken a MASSIVE leap forward. Before, these cutscenes were not only unskippable, but the animations to our characters were very noticeably stiff, and the movement in these scenes were very limited. This is not the fault of the devs who worked on these games, since that was all the PlayStation software could allow for, but now our characters are actually allowed to move during these endgame cutscenes, which makes them much more engaging and fun to watch. While the animations are still janky, this is 2000 and 2001 technology. Seeing a game like this back then would be the equivalent of seeing a game like The Last of Us Part 2 today. Capcom was seriously pushing boundaries when it came to what they were able to pull off. 
That's not to say the implementation of CG cutscenes are gone though. Nope, they make a glorious return and they look pretty damn good. Seeing them in a modern port will look a little off since they're pre-rendered and they tend to clash with the now higher resolution of the end game stuff, but that's not of course a fault of the game itself. And last but certainly not least is the camera. As you all know, the classic RE games used fixed camera angles and Code Veronica continues the tradition. However, because we're in the 6th generation now, Capcom had much more freedom to experiment with the camera and it will do things like pan out, zoom in, or follow your character depending on the angle. It's not a huge thing, but my god does it look clean. So yeah, the game looks beautiful, and for a 2000 game with a slightly improved 2001 version, it has no right looking this beautiful for the time it came out. Resident Evil has a history of trying to reach for the stars in terms of graphical fidelity with each new release, and they certainly didn't stop with Code Veronica. But what about the different environments and locations you'll be visiting? Well, first, there's the prison, the area you start out in. This location is really dark and eerie, as you'd expect from a zombified prison, and easily strives the most out of any location to be the most horror-focused. After that is the mansion. Yep, in a nice callback to RE1, you find yourself in another zombified mansion. This location has pristine and elegant feel to it, with enough dark and tight rooms to provoke an uncomfortable response. Then there's the residence, my favorite area from an aesthetic standpoint. This is a completely dark and isolated castle-like building that provokes what I can only describe as a soft dread. I especially love the music that plays once you come up here. Next is the Antarctic facility which is just as unsettling as the other locations. This is easily the most isolated and remote environment in the entire game and that alone makes it creepy, but it's also cold and haunting. This really feels like a place you are not supposed to be in. And finally there's the second mansion which for the most part keeps the same feel as the previous mansion. So yeah, those are the different locations you go to at the game and they all vary when it comes to the specific way they want to be unsettling. And the final checkmark when it comes to this game's good presentation is the soundtrack. Without a question, the best soundtrack in any Resident Evil game ever. Takeshi Mura, the person who orchestrated this OST, is fucking talented. The many different tracks in this game sound absolutely amazing, and it's kinda crazy how beautiful some of them are. The soundtrack can so easily range from intense to triumphant to unsettling to beautiful. This game both looks and sound amazing. The people who worked on this wanted to make absolutely sure they were transporting the iconic feel of Resident Evil to next gen, and they did not disappoint. No, they excelled. However, I could go on and on about the stellar presentation and that wouldn't be enough to convince you of a purchase. No, that's the gameplay's job, so how does it stack up? Well, I have a lot to say regarding that front. I'm going to say this right now, it is important to keep in mind that Code Veronica was in development alongside Resident Evil 3. The reason I mention that is because it is blatantly obvious that the crazy innovations seen in RE3 are completely absent. This includes decision making, the ability to freely run up and down stairs, the dodge mechanic, and even ammo mixing despite it still being present in the game in a different manner. Now what you're probably thinking is, wouldn't the two studios working on both of these titles be communicating with each other so both experiences would keep the other in mind? Well, that is what usually happens, however it appears the team working on this game just didn't really bother. I can't really blame them since RE3 was originally not even supposed to be a mainline title, it was instead going to be a unique spin-off of an indie aesthetic, but as we all know, that's not what happened. This is even somewhat noticeable of the story to an extent since there's no mention of the Raccoon City explosion and it picks up Claire's story directly after 2. Because of all of this, playing Kovanica, especially after 3, feels like a step down since it's missing a lot of the cool mechanics the previous game added. But with that aside, does Kovanica hold out well as an RE game in general? Well, let's start with the controls. Using the exact same control scheme as the previous games with the exception of switching the run button for some reason, the game plays exactly the same as a classic RE game would. But what terrors lurk in the dark awaiting their chance to consume you? Well let's start with the enemy variety. This is one of my favorite parts of doing these reviews since the variety and unique and varied threats are one of my favorite aspects of Resident Evil. Starting out with familiar faces, there's the zombies, the main threat you'll once again be facing. 
One thing I love about Code Veronica is how it makes a pretty damn good attempt at making zombies feel like much more than a casual obstacle, but rather a genuine threat. The last games did this too, but Code Veronica challenges the player with waves and waves of the undead. They're not clumsily thrown at you, but there's enough of them to make you have to either fight or avoid them throughout the duration of this entry. After that are the Cerberuses, zombie dogs that will charge at you and are mostly feared due to their incredible speed and vicious bites. Then there are the spiders, who are referred to in this game specifically as Black Widows. Yes, they still mess with my arachnophobia, and yes, I want to move on. Then there's the hunters, who are just as vicious as they were in RE1, but are pretty minor due to their limited screen time. Alright, well, what else? Wait, was that it? Yeah, Kovanica has only 4 returning enemy types, with the rest being brand new. This caught me by surprise when working on this video because I didn't even realize how many unique enemy types this game introduces. The first and most minor are the bats. Much like the crows in the previous games, they are airborne enemies that are pretty tricky to hit. However, they will ignore you entirely if you happen to have the lighter equipped. Second are the bandit snatchers. Arguably the most notable new enemy type in the game, simply due to their memorable stretchy arms and constant persistence throughout. These one-armed freaks are in no need of two limbs. They use their stretchy arm to quickly traverse from one place to another and also hit the player from a decent range. These banner snatchers are viewed as annoying by the majority of people who played this game, and I used to agree. But I would be lying if I said they weren't growing on me. I love how their very simple ability to stretch their arm can look really sick from a design standpoint. Plus they weren't too hard to handle as long as you held onto some handy dandy flame arrows and or grenade launcher rounds. Third are the Albinoid Infants. These creatures show up for a blink in your miss-up moment in the game, and they're not hard to handle. I mean, look at them. But they're neat from a lore perspective. After that are the moths and uh... <clears throat> Sorry, um, just let me... FUCK THESE THINGS! Sorry, I just had to let that out. Basically, there's this one hall later in the game full of these moths who infinitely respawn. What they'll do is they'll fly over to you and implant you with an egg that'll poison you after a randomized amount of seconds. Luckily, it's an infinite supply of blue herbs that are placed inside said hallway. So how this plays out is you need to kill all the moths in the hall to perceive where you're going. If you get an egg implanted in you, you have to just sit there and wait until it hatches. And at that time, let's hope you didn't go through a door because then you'll have to kill the moths all over again just to heal yourself of your poison. Keep in mind, this hall connects one important side of the area with another, so every time you need to get from one room to the next, you have to kill all the moths in this hall without getting poisoned. You can probably see how this just drags the pacing to a halt and is super annoying above anything. Next are the sweepers. Basically hunters except they have the ability to poison you. Whoever came up with venomous hunters is the embodiment of pure evil. In all seriousness, these hunter variants are so minor to the game, I'm not entirely sure why they were added in the first place. And finally, there are the ants. Once you enter a room at the end of the game, you'll see hundreds of infected ants moving on the floor, but they only deal minor damage. That's all the normal enemies you encounter, and it's pretty obvious the devs missed more of their shots when it came to introducing new enemies than they landed. While I think the bandit snatchers are alright, everything else kinda sucks. I'm of course referring to the new enemies. I think the old ones are not only great threads, but they're also integrated smoothly into this new game's layout and pacing. Overall, while some of these newer threads are pretty dull, the enemy variety is nice overall, and I think it serves the overall experience well when it comes to spicing up the gameplay. But of course, that's only the standard enemies. Moving on to sub-bosses, first is the Gulp Worm, basically the Gravedigger from RE3, except... Basically the Gravedigger from RE3. At first it just moves around and attempts to pursue you for the first half of the game, but then you get a chance to finish it off once and for all in a pretty easy boss battle. And finally, there's the giant black widow who can be so easily avoided it's not even funny. It looks scary as hell, don't get me wrong, but it's relatively harmless. Alright, sub-bosses overall, but let's go bigger. Time to talk about the main bosses. The first main fight of the game is with the motherfucking tyrant. Yep, the main final boss at the end of every previous Resident Evil game is the first thing you fight for real. Its fight is in two stages. The first stage is in a single, load of bullets until he drops encounter. With stage 2 though, things are a little more interesting. Since you're on a cargo plane, the area you shove the tyrant is very limited and he has a lot of possible moves. The way to beat him is to run up to this switch and send this load of cargo towards him to push him out. This has to be done around 3 times with a charge up after each launch. 
The thing I love about the fight is if you actually damage the tyrant enough at the start of the encounter, you only need to send one cargo at him before ending the fight. This can be done pretty quickly if you have the right gear. It's little things like these why I love Resident Evil's gameplay so much. The key to an easier experience is to work smarter, not harder. The next fight is with the Nosferatu, a mutated monster with four spider-like appendages from its back. The fight isn't all that appealing. I unironically like how you can get knocked off during this battle and fall to your death since it adds a great deal of suspense. But the boss is not all that exciting to go up against since its moveset is pretty bleh and there's no way in hell you're not supposed to get poisoned here. Then towards the end of the game is Alexia Ashford. I fucking love this fight. You find yourself at the entrance of the mansion and you're tasked with unloading onto Alexia while simultaneously avoiding her deadly fire abilities. What makes this fight tense is if Alexia touches you, you are fucking dead, no questions asked, and her fire can stun lock you if you're not careful, giving the boss ample time to reach you. I just really love this fight. And yeah, those are all of the boss fights. If it looks like I missed any sub or main bosses, I'm saving them for when I touch on the story. It's really cool to see Code Veronica make an effort to have some pretty interesting boss fights. The Tyrant, Nosferatu, and Alexia all play differently in some sort of fun way. I'll even go as far as to say these are the best boss fights the series has seen thus far. Overall, there are a lot of different monsters to be facing throughout your journey, and it helps keep the gameplay both interesting and fresh. However, the only thing as important as the enemies are the weapons to be using to take them down. And trust me, Code Veronica has quite the arsenal. First is a combat knife, and it's actually not that bad this time around. I personally didn't rely on it that much, but a lot of people actually use this thing, and I can see why. Second is the M9VR handgun. It plays like your typical Resident Evil handgun. It'll get the job done, but not in a quick rate, so it's wise to use it from a distance. The really cool thing about this handgun, however, is it can be upgraded into the M9VR Burst. I'm not even sure if the damage is increased, but the fire rate is significantly improved, making it much more reliable. Third are the Deer World M100Ps, pretty much decent weapons that you obtain super early in the game and much like the ARs and SMGs, they don't take any normal ammo and would deplete all together after a certain amount of usage. Fourth is the Bowgun. Yeah, it's still as useless as it was in RE2 since all it does is shoot arrows that don't do a lick of damage. At least that's what I would say if it wasn't for the newly introduced Bowgun Powder. Combining this with normal Bowgun arrows will create flame arrows that are outright explosive upon impact. Obviously the game doesn't load you with this stuff, but if saved for bosses, it can be super handy. Fourth is the dual wield engram submachine gun. You can use these for a specific section during the first half of the game, but it can unlock them in its later half. Yeah, it's an SMG that can dispatch zombies left and right, it can serve a helping hand during boss encounters. Fifth is the M79 grenade launcher. Like the past games, it's a grenade launcher that can take grenade rounds, flame rounds, and acid rounds. While the freeze rounds introduced in the third game are absent, it's replaced by the newly introduced gas rounds. As always, it's crucial to save this powerhouse of a weapon for enemies deserving of its damage such as bosses and sub-bosses alike. The sixth weapon is the AK-47 Assault Rifle. I never really found too much use out of it, but like the SMG, it can reliably take out the undead without wasting ammo on your main arsenal. Seventh is the MR7 Sniper Rifle. You can only use this weapon during the Nosferatu fight, or at least that's how everyone and their mom uses it, and it's pretty damn good. While I never got to see what it could do to a normal enemy, it deals a big portion of damage on Nosferatu and can even kill him in 4 shots if you're able to hit his weak points. It only has so many shots though, so be sure to enjoy it while it lasts. Eighth is the Glock 17 handgun which belongs to the second playable character of the game, and it plays much like the m 9 dr handgun, except when modified, its damage output increases which makes dispatching zombies all the more easier. The ninth weapon is the Spaz 12 shotgun. I got a shotgun. It's a shotgun capable of holding 7 shells that can be used to instantly decapitate zombies, it can also be used against bigger threats like the Hunters and Bandit Snatchers. An attempt weapon is the Colt Python, the traditional magnum of the game. It can once again insta-kill almost anything, but it's wise to save it for the final boss. That's it for all the normal weapons in the game, but what about the special ones? Well, if you play as Steve in a game mode I'll touch on later, you can use the Lugers, basic dual wield revolvers that are admittedly kinda lackluster. And then there's the beautiful infinite rocket launcher which can only be acquired if you get an A rank in the main game. Yeah, I know this game has an amazing arsenal. They managed to introduce a decent amount of weapons while having most of them play differently in some way. It somehow even manages to outshine RA3's arsenal which, if you've remembered, was pretty damn big. 
But now with both enemies and weaponry out of the way, let's talk about the game flow. The reason I want to touch on this is because, and I'm not kidding, Code Veronica till this day is arguably the longest RE game ever to come out, only being beaten by RE6. In fact, the time needed for an A rank is 4 hours and 30 minutes. That's a long ass time considering that's the time needed for the highest rank in the game. With the original release, this caused the game to be separated into two separate discs, but this wasn't a problem for Code Veronica X, which was on more powerful consoles. Now when it comes to pacing, one huge praise I give Code Veronica is how good that aspect is. The game really feels like a slog to get to, the locations you're exploring are interesting and full of personality, and the puzzles this time around are pretty damn good. They're not in your face obvious, but you're rewarded by reading notes that give you hints on how to get access to certain areas. But I hate to be a Debbie Downer here, however there is one part I don't like about this game. During a certain point, you switch over to a new character and you explore the area the previous character explored. Granted, while there are changes to the environment to keep the gameplay fresh, this section has always been a slog to me since the story isn't progressing and you're just revisiting locations you've already been before. Other than that, the pacing is great and it also feels good to speedrun, despite its jarring length. This brings us over to something I've been quite eager to talk about since I started playing this review. The difficulty. I have no idea why, but Code Veronica has this weird stigma behind it where everyone believes it's the Resident Evil equivalent of Dark Souls and it's the hardest game in the series. Do not get me wrong, this game kicked my ass at several points and it is by no means a walk in the park. But I don't know why people say it's that difficult. As discussed in the weapons section, the game gives you plenty of tools to handle yourself, ammo drops are scattered all over the place if you look well enough, and herb placements aren't all that rare. In fact, if you ask me, I would say RE3 is harder simply because of both Nemesis and the hordes of zombies walking around. I never had too much difficulty with this one. Although, if you're a newcomer to the series, it's highly advised to play a more forgiving entry in the series because Code Veronica certainly doesn't pull its punches. With all that said, let's conclude the gameplay section of the review with a feature exclusive to Code Veronica X, Battle Game. In this mercenary-like mode, you can play as four different characters, each complete with their own arsenal of weapons. The key with Battle Game is to fight your way through a random mix of different locations throughout until you fight one of the four bosses of the game. When you're playing as Claire, you have a combat knife, handgun, and bow gun with flame arrows, with the final boss being Nosferatu. When playing as other Claire, who is the same character except for more interesting outfit, she has an inventory of a combat knife, AK-47, and grenade launcher, with the final boss being the tyrant. Chris Redfield has an inventory with a combat knife, shotgun, and magnum. His final boss is the final final boss of the game. Next is Steve Burnside, who's running the SMGs, gold lugers, and a combat knife, with his final boss being the gulp worm. It's also worth noting that each of these characters' weapons have infinite ammo. I initially viewed Battle Game as a lazy, pointless addition to the game, but upon trying it, it's actually pretty fun and it throws in a nice bit of replay value since each of these characters have ranks you can get. There's also a really cool option where you can play Battle Game in first person. Aside from PS1's Resident Evil Survivor, this was the first time you could do that in a Resident Evil game and it looks sick. Now I bet 0.1% of you realized that I skipped Resident Evil Survivor for this retrospective. No, that wasn't an accident. One, I don't have the game, and two, it's Resident Evil Survivor. Come on. Yeah, that basically wraps up the gameplay of Code Veronica X, and wow, what a treat. Despite lacking several cool features its predecessor introduced, Code Veronica by all means still manages to be an incredible experience with all the survival horror magic we've come to know brought to the 6th generation in an amazing package. The devs who worked on this game deserve a huge pat on the back because they undoubtedly did a phenomenal job. But this is a Resident Evil game, so don't think we're done here because there's of course the story to go over, which the series so far has put a great deal of effort into over the past three games. Like I mentioned earlier, this story continues the journey of Claire Redfield after she survived the horrors of Raccoon City with Leon Kennedy and Sherry Birkin. As those of you who played RE2 know, Claire was unsuccessful in finding her brother Chris Redfield, and this game shows us what's become of that search with the following cutscene.
don't move. Yeah, if this cutscene is anything to go by, Claire Redfield is capable of much more than we originally thought if she's able to infiltrate a highly secured umbrella base. Some people may view this as completely unrealistic, and while I see where you're coming from, Claire did survive Raccoon City all while looking after a child by herself, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that she's capable of pulling off such a feat. I also want to highlight how cool Claire is in this game. She still has her wit and sassiness from the second game while still being pretty badass and level-headed. We see her wake up in a cell where a guard by the name of Rodrigo frees her from her cell and explains an unidentified army has attacked the base and there's no point in keeping her prisoner anymore. Clara sets off to find a way out of here when she realizes something horrifying. Yep, it turns out the T-Virus has found its way onto the island, and Clara is stuck in the same nightmare she was in during Raccoon City. She doesn't make it but a few feet from the undead when this happens. Wait, don't you? Who are you? Huh? You're not a zombie. Well, great. Wait right there. I'm coming over. Uh, sorry about that little misunderstanding, but I thought you were another one of those mon- Shut up. Make one wrong move and I'll shoot. Relax, beautiful. I said I was sorry. Meet Steve. You either love him or hate him. I'll go more into his character later, but for now, Claire continues exploring Rockford Island, which she learns is the name for it. One thing I really like about Cold Veronica is how much mystery it sets up at the beginning. We don't know where the hell we are, we don't know much about Steve, we don't know why the island is being attacked, and we're only given tidbits about the malicious and crazy head of the facility, Alfred Ashford. After more exploration, Claire once again runs into Steve. Well, it seems your brother is under surveillance by Umbrella. What? I've got to contact Leon and tell him to let my brother know he's being monitored. It's a good thing I have access to an outside connection from here. Well, that file shows the latitude and longitude of this place. <laughs> Why don't you send your brother the coordinates and ask him to come help? Thanks. I'll do that. Hey! I was just kidding. There's no way he could get here, even if he is your brother. Yes, he can. I'm sure of it. No way. He won't come. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. Believe me, I know. What was that all about? Claire's reaction to this is absolutely perfect. Also, a few things I want to go over here. One, why does Claire have Leon email Chris instead of just doing it herself? This is probably because Chris has been ghosting her, which we as the players know this was done for her own protection, so she trusts he's more likely to respond to Leon as opposed to her. But this raises the obvious question, how does Leon have Chris's email? It makes sense for him to have it, but when did he get it? Claire's epilogue makes it clear she left in a hurry at the RE2, so that's not really clear. I know tiny issues like these aren't a big deal, but it'd be nice if the game took time to clarify them. Claire makes it out of the prison into a pristine mansion where she has to save Steve who traps himself. Steve has a key item necessary for progression, but he's not willing to budge on the weapon unless he gets something in return which is automatic. The patience Claire has is very impressive. But after she tries to leave, this happens. you interfere with my operation. What are you talking about? You let yourself be captured so you could lead your people to this base. I have no idea what you're babbling about. You don't fool me. I am Alfred Ashford, commander of this base. Oh? You must be one of Umbrella's lower level officers if you're in command of a backwater base like this one. How dare you? The Ashford family is among the world's first and finest. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella Inc. Mm. 
Now tell me, why have you attacked this installation? Attacked? Shortly after you arrived, my base was attacked. You must have informed your people of its location. I still don't follow you. I really don't know anything about that. Unacceptable! How can you deny it? My base has been destroyed. And thanks to you, the experimental T-Virus was released, creating countless zombies and monsters. Tell me, who do you work for? Who sent you? <laughs> Have it your way, then. You're just a rat in a cage anyway. I'll be sure to keep you entertained before I dispose of you. <laughs> Being honest, I fucking love Alfred Asford. Easily one of the biggest highlights of the game. In the past RE games, the human antagonists have consisted of level-headed, straightforward, normal men and women with some nefarious or selfish goal in mind. But Alfred stands out because the game makes it clear off the bat that he is fucking insane. He's an egotistical, rich jackass with some sort of mysterious agenda. Also, he's just downright entertaining. Claire continues exploring the facility when... <laughs> Welcome, Claire. Consider the area you are in a special playground I have prepared just for you. Please try and keep me amused, and do not disappoint me by dying too soon. I so want to enjoy this. <laughs> that is possibly the best laugh in video game history. Claire spots some SMGs for Steve and goes down to get them when she's attacked by a banner snatcher. Steve comes to the rescue, however, and now has some SMGs to play with. The two continue forward and... Steve, behind you! No! Wait! I... I can't! No! Ah! Father! Dad. I used to work for Umbrella. I tried to steal information. Intending to sell it off to the highest bidder. He was caught. Mom was killed, and we were sent here. Oh, Steve. He was a fool to do something so reckless. So stupid. Now, I think I can finally talk about Steve more in depth. I really like his character. I get it, he's annoying, incompetent, and kind of full of himself. However, the game shows that his confident persona is all a facade. Deep down, he's just a scared kid who completely isolated himself from everybody and no longer sees the virtue of relying on others after his father let him down and destroyed his family because of a stupid mistake. Steve, in actuality, does have a good heart. Besides, I think he's very refreshing as far as RE characters go. So far, every Resident Evil character we've met has been a complete badass with maybe the exception of Leon, who is a rookie officer although he still held his own pretty well given the circumstances. But Steve, on the other hand, is a different story. He's insecure, rash, and doesn't always make the smart move. And because of that, he feels human. We can somewhat relate to Steve since he's actually an ordinary person who is unjustly put into the situation because of someone else's mistakes. Back to Claire, she continues to try to find a way off the island when she runs into not only Alfred, but Alexia Ashford, his sister who's also the head of the family. And you learn much more about the Ashford legacy. The family's acquired drug was the work of a woman named Veronica, and through the years, the family was extremely prideful. Then came along Edward Ashford, who would go on to be one of the three original founders of Umbrella along with Oswald E. Spencer. His son, Alexander Ashford, worked under him, 
During the Positivists, though, Edward passed away, and Alexander established a secret facility in the Antarctic to desperately keep up with the other Umbrella researchers. I'll stop right now and say the lore contributions this game makes are amazing. It gives much more context to not only the villains of the game, but also succeeds in further fleshing out the universe. Eventually, Claire is about to enter the mansion again after nearly having the keys to escape this nightmare when a familiar face resurfaces. Greetings. You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Who are you? Let's just say that I'm a ghost, coming back to haunt your dear brother. Oscar? <laughs> All the better for me. Now that the cat dragged in this nice surprise, your ever so caring brother will definitely show up. I must thank you for being such good bait. I don't know what went on between you two, but you have them all wrong. My brother is not the kind of person you think he is. I despise Chris. Uh, what are you gonna do to him? <laughs> what? What is it? Stay there. I'm coming. It appears you may be of some further use to me. I'm going to let you live a little longer. That's right, Albert Wesker, the treacherous former captain of the STARS team, has seemingly returned from the dead after being impaled in the first game. Not only that, but it is evident something about him has changed. Not only did he demonstrate superhuman abilities by tossing Claire around like a ragdoll, but he now has a burning hatred for Chris who he blames for his botched plan in the first game. In that cutscene alone, you're instantly shown Wesker is back, and he is not to be fucked with. However, in the original, this cutscene didn't exist and the rescue reveal was saved for later. Claire manages to finally find a way out which is approached by Alexia Ashford. Steve barges in and after a short gunfight, Alexia disappears into the other room, closely followed by our characters. This must be... Wait a second. What just happened? So there never was an Alexia after all. You mean, he thinks he's two people? Yeah, apparently Alfred is so far gone, the entire time we saw Alexia, it was just Alfred in disguise. Now it's time to further touch upon Alfred's character. You see, Alexia does exist, but after Mysterious disappearance, Alfred lost his mind and pretended to be his sister. This is because, as hinted in the previous parts of the game, Alfred and his sister shared, to put it bluntly, an incestuous relationship, with Alfred being so in love with Alexia, he practically worships her. Our characters have had enough of this crazy shit, and they decide to get out of here as the facility begins to self-destruct. I will not allow you fools to escape! This is what you get for trying to oppose me! Now feel my revenge! <laughs> I fucking love this villain so much. Claire runs into a fucking tyrant but manages to get past it in order to the plane with Steve as they left off. But they're not home free just yet since the tyrant has somehow found its way onto the cargo of the plane. Claire is able to blow it sky high. What was wrong? Oh nothing. Just a giant cockroach that had to be stepped on. That's... the Antarctic. We're over the Antarctic! What? They're quick to get to work and find a way out of here, and Clara comes across a mysterious creature by the name of the Nosferatu, which is thankfully being held in chains. She and Steve comes across a vehicle that can be their way out of this nightmare, but after getting distracted by admiring Claire, Steve accidentally busts a pipeline that starts spilling toxic gas. This delays the two's escape, but Claire is thankfully able to stop the gas. <sighs> We're safe now. Take a game, Claire. I shall enjoy watching you shriek in agony. Not this time! You game! Yeah. 
The two take the vehicle and bust out of the facility. They take an escape route, but not before being confronted by Nosferatu. Steve is put out of commission, and after a one-on-one -on -one fight, Claire puts an end to the creature and saves Steve. I won't forget about this, Claire. With Alfred dead and the real Alexia reawakened from cryosleep, the fate of Claire and Steve doesn't look good. With all hope lost, it's time to change to a new perspective. I guess it's a good time to go into Chris's character in this game, and he's the same as we saw him in RE1, except a little more expressive of his emotions. He's still the confident, determined badass we all know and love, and it's nice to see him again after 4 years of games. He explores the now wrecked Rockford Island for a way out after learning Claire escaped. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. Wesker? He's still alive? <laughs> what are you doing here? I came for Alexia. Who? An organization hired me to capture her. Wait, you attacked the island? And my sister? Here's a little secret, Chris. I figured out that your sister is now in the Antarctic with Alexia. It's too bad you won't be seeing her again. <laughs> Alexia? <laughs> this encounter these two share is amazing. Keep in mind that Chris looked up to Wesker during his time in Stars, so this moment where a former captain and his old loyal ally meet face to face at the said captain's backstabbing betrayal is amazing. And we also see more of Wesker's mysterious powers and he was not only the one responsible for the island's attack, but is eager to find Alexia. 
I love the decision to bring Wesker back. Not only is he amazing here, but they make him both a physical and even an intellectual threat who has sold his soul to a new organization after the mess of Umbrella. He is an intimidating obstacle our characters have to deal with once more. Chris finds a jet and goes to the Antarctic facility. Here you can find Alfred's diary, and it's here where we finally learn the full story behind the Ashford trends. As Alexander Ashford was failing to live up to his father and honor the Ashford family line, he genetically created two twins as his offspring, Alfred and Alexia. These twins were gifted extreme intelligence and they were Alexander's key to restoring honor to the family legacy. But the twins were not fond of their father in the slightest, and Alexia had the idea of testing a new virus she created by using the T-Virus as a basis. The T-Veronica virus. This was the T-Virus fused with ant DNA that could potentially gift the user with insane powers. They used their father as a guinea pig and the virus backfired horribly and mutated him into the Nosferatu. Yep, the Nosferatu was actually a mutated Alexander Ashford, who, after hearing his son get fairly wounded, attacked Claire and Steve because the love for his children still remained, even after all the harm they'd done. The twins locked Alexander away after his transformation, and Alexia realized in order for her body to fully handle the T. Veronica virus, it has to be prepped. So a machine was designed to make Alexia's body capable of handling it, which also acted as a cryostation, and she waited inside for 15 years before being reawakened by Alfred. Also keep in mind, all of this happened when the twins were children, so despite having the body of an adult, she still has the mind of a kid which explains her childlike behavior. I love these two villains, and in a way, I almost feel sorry for them. Despite Alexander clearly loving his children, they were both genetically created to make up for him tarnishing their family reputation, which made them feel completely betrayed. Even though they're both clearly evil, all Alfred ever wanted was to make his sister happy and all Alexia wants is to use the T-Veronica virus to become the ruler of humanity and, in her eyes, make the world a better place under her leadership. These are two antagonists with so much personality and two separate goals that are both understandable and make you see them as human. Back to the story at hand, Chris finds Claire and manages to free her, and after three games, the reunion between these two is so heartwarming. Chris! I missed you so much. I know. But we have to get out of here. Not yet. We have to find Steve. Who's Steve? He's a boy who escaped from that island with me. But then a monster attacked us and we got separated. So that means Steve is still somewhere in this base? I'm sure of it. After hearing Steve scream, the two run for the room but are separated by Alexia, so Claire continues ahead. No, I can't do it. Who did this to you? That crazy woman told me she was going to perform the same experiment on me that she did on her own father. She's completely insane. Uh. What's wrong? Claire! Can't breathe! Claire! Help me! Oh, Steve. 
Steve, you've got to hang in there, okay? Uh, my brother's come to save us. We're getting out of here. Your... brother kept his promise. I'm sorry, I cannot. What? What are you saying? I'm glad that I met you. I... I love you. Claire. Steve? 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 This moment is nothing short of heartbreaking. Seeing Steve's body mutate uncontrollably until he turns into a horrifying abomination is shocking. But for the first and spoiler alert, only time in the series, the person who we all take for granted is strong enough to resist the virus entirely. And the way his death plays out is tear-jerking and makes me choke each and every time I see it. Steve wasn't perfect, but that's what I love about him, and he will be missed. At last, I found you, Alexia. Come with me. <laughs> You're responsible for the creation of the T. Veronica virus. And now the only existing sample is in your body. I want it. Now. You want it? You are not worthy of its power. You're one of my best men. I'll let you handle this. Fun fact, in the original game, Wesker just gets his ass kicked by Alexia before fleeing and exiting the game entirely, but I'm so glad it was changed because this scene is so goddamn epic. And Alexia's transformation is absolutely stunning visually, and her ability to turn her blood into literal fire is so cool. I know we've come a long way from simple biomutated monsters in the original game, and the series is starting to jump the shark a bit, but if you allow me to be completely subjective for a bit, I do not care. I don't care how realistic or believable the story is, as long as it's good and explained on some scientific or practical level, that's all that matters to me. Chris defeats Alexia and learns from Claire about Steve's death. Chris pushes on and finds a way out of the facility, but in the process, activates the entire basis self-destruct mode. Oops. It's time to get the fuck out of here. Uh. 
and that puts an end to the Ashfords once and for all. Chris finds Claire being dragged away by Wesker and he quickly runs to save her. Promise me, please promise that you won't leave me alone again. I'm sorry, Claire, but it's not over yet. There's still something we've got to do. You mean... Yeah, it's payback time. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now, let's finish this once and for all! And that was the story of Resident Evil Code Veronica X. This is still the best Resident Evil story in the entire series for me. What else do you need? Claire, Steve, and Chris are all super likable and are easily the most fleshed out RA protagonists so far. The main villains, Alex and Alexia Ashford, have an amazing backstory with a considerable amount of depth. They bring back Albert Wesker from the first game and make him a pretty exciting antagonist while also adding a great deal of mystery surrounding not only his resurrection, but newfound powers. And the story has so many emotional and well-directed moments, it's insane. The main thing that drives the best stories to me are emotion, and you feel that throughout the whole game. You feel Clara's desperation to find her brother and Chris's desperation to find his sister. You feel Steve's insecurity that later develops into love for Claire. You feel Alfred's total devotion to Alexia. You feel the burning rage held between Chris and his former captain. There is so much emotion present throughout the entire story and it's all fleshed out so well. This is not just how you do a Resident Evil story. No, this is how you do a story in general. Cole Veronica has solidified itself as the greatest story in the series for me, and I want to commend the writing team who did such a great job working on it. Resident Evil Cole Veronica X is not only, in my opinion, the best Resident Evil game I've reviewed for this retrospective so far, but definitely one of, if not, my favorite Resident Evil game of all time. It is definitely in my top 10 games of all time, and I mean that. It's challenging enough to keep you engaged even on new playthroughs, but not to the point where it feels cheap. There's an insane arsenal of weapons, the big enemy variety keeps the game fresh, the visuals are outstanding for their time, the soundtrack is perfect, there's a lot of replayability, and the story is exceptionally beautiful. It's a damn shame not many people have experienced Code Veronica X for themselves, but if you're interested, you can easily obtain it for practically every console under the sun except for every Nintendo console, but the GameCube and the original Xbox. I highly recommend it. This game has so many amazing factors that go into it, and it is why I ultimately consider Resident Evil Code Veronica X to be a bizarre masterpiece.